afternoon and welcome to our Grow Native webinar, Lincoln University's Finca Eco Farm with Nadia Navarrete Tyndall. My name is Erica Van Franken. I'm the Outreach and Special Projects Coordinator for the Missouri Prairie, Founda Prairie Foundation and its Grow Native program. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this webinar today. During the presentation, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A section on your screen. And at the end, the Foundation's Executive Director, Carol David, will read those out to Nadia. This webinar is being recorded and the link will be shared with all of you tomorrow along with resources mentioned during the presentation and Q&A session. Dr. Nadia Navarrete Tyndall owns the consulting business Native Plants and More and is also the specialty crops and native plant specialist for Lincoln University in Jefferson City. In her work at Lincoln University, Nadia created the Native Plants Program, the Community Garden Farmers Market and Commercial Kitchen, and the Finca Project, Families Integrating Nature, Conservation, and Agriculture. She has more than 20 years of experience as a specialist in diverse specialty crops, with a main emphasis on native plants in both Missouri and her native El Salvador. She recently launched the Native Plants Academy in collaboration with the Missouri Prairie Foundation to provide education to underserved individuals on various topics related to native plants, including career opportunities. She offers workshops in Spanish and English. In 2008, she received Missouri's highest conservation honor as she was inducted into the Conservation Hall of Fame as a master conservationist. And now I will turn it over to Nadia. Thank you, Erica. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today, I will talk about the Finca Eco Farm at Lincoln University, but I will give you a little history of how we got here. And I work at Lincoln University, and maybe I hope that most of you know that Lincoln University is located in Jefferson City in Missouri, and is a, a, a historically Black college a university. And as a, 18 more universities in the country. It's a very diverse university and it's, kind of, it's a very fun place, it's very small. So we can concentrate on certain on special topics. I'm in charge of the specialty crops program where we are promoting mostly native plants as crops, as specialty crops. But we also uh, grow, grow non-natives and the idea is to grow them sustainably. This is the staff of the program, uh, Tony Spatter, uh, Sue Bartlett, Jeromia, who just finished with us, is still a volunteer for, with us and myself. We have a couple more people that will be joining us uh, shortly, we hope in a couple months. So the idea of Finca came, became for the, from the fact that Finca in Spanish means a small, a small farm. That's what you call a small farm in Latin America, including El Salvador, El Salvador, where I am from. But in Missouri, we were looking for an acronym to use to, to promote similar um, kind of practices. So we found Finca, the perfect acronym for families integrating nature, conservation, and agriculture. And, and the name says it, says it all. We work with people, we work with nature, we try to protect and con, uh, do conservation, mostly with native plants, but at the same time, we use them as crops in a sustainable way. During the time when we were working on the Finca project, we visited El Salvador, where some of our um, stakeholders went with us and also our staff on the right, you see Sue Bartolet taking a, a video. So it was really nice to see firsthand how people did uh, or have their fincas in El Salvador. We took some those ideas and brought them uh, to us. And we have two other fincas in the southwest, I'm sorry, in southeast uh, Missouri in the Boot Hill, that those are private. And, but we have one that is public. It is located at the university and it has been functioning since 2012 when we started uh, planting. That is the drawing, as you can see here, was done by Sue Bartolette, 
And if it looks a little busy, it might, it's because we, I couldn't fit more, more words in this design, but it's, when you come, you feel that warmth because it feels like home. And then, and this is a more artistic design also by Sue. So that gives you an idea how diverse this um, area is. It's no more than an acre. And it's um, established, as you can see, surrounding the teaching greenhouse that has been here since the 1960s or even more, but it has been restored. So we use it now as our teaching grounds. So we have outdoor and indoor uh, areas. The finga, we, we try to use, as I say, every single space possible. In the front, we are now establishing a little prairie uh, just to welcome everyone that comes here. This was on th this year. And here we have on the left, Clara Bryant and Marsha Hayes on the right, who are one of the two volunteers that come regularly to help us. This is an aerial view um, taken by Anan Anderson, um, extension educator with us. So this, was, this picture was taken just yesterday. And you can see that even though with this heat, we have still a few, this is actually, a, if you can see next to the tarp, blue tarp in the middle, we have a big um, clump of hairy mountain mint. And there are so many things to show you that I won't be able to describe everything right now, but it's just to excite you and it made you come and visit us. But every single place that you can see is being used. So more to do. We have a, the teaching greenhouse is used as a, as a, for demonstrations and for teaching. And we have raised beds that are used a, for plant propagation, but also to grow our, our own crops. It depends on the year. Last year we grew garlic and it did really well, but this year it got really too hot. It was too soon, too hot, and they didn't do well. But we, we had them outside. And we have grown other uh, plants like kale, but we like to mix them with native plants. Like in this case, for example, later in the year, you will see godweed, uh, an annual, that is uh, the, a host plant for, the, for a butterfly that grows as a ground cover. We have workshops with hands-on training volunteer opportunities. We usually do it, uh, Sue organizes the volunteer um, project. And we have also a classroom where we offer slideshow presentations right next to the teaching greenhouse. We have a native plant nursery. We also grow non-natives as I mentioned before, but most of the plants we grow are, are native plants. We sell them at the farmer's market, at the Lincoln University farmer's market, but we try not to just focus on the native edibles and the, those that people really are looking always for, like milkweeds. <clears throat> this is another view. These are the front beds. I mentioned the hairy mountain mint. And this big clump here that you see, the, we've, actually we had three clumps of uh, pokeweed. We love pokeweed because it's a perfect plant in the, in the summer, especially for birds, not only for pollinators in the spring when they bloom, but also for, for a shelter and fruit for the birds in the, in the winter, fall, winter. This is just a, a, a close up of what it could be. The first one, just an idea for you. The first bed is actually with uh, annual crops. It changes every year. We have native mints and we use them with the idea that our resident groundhogs won't eat the tomatoes if they smell the mints around them. So this is um, a research in progress. We wanna see by planting uh, tomatoes in the middle of the mints if the groundhogs don't see them. But they're pretty smart so far, but we'll see. We'll, we'll keep you posted. We have fig beds, those were new, were established last year. And we have also papa, 
trees in the front. We have added an international community garden that we just got started. We got some grant, a grant from an anonymous a founder, a funding agency. So we're going to be able to grow, a, to establish this garden for international students, but with the idea that they have a chance to mingle with the community. This will be open to all. In, in the backyard of the finca, is what I call it, we have a variety of fruit trees as well as in different native plants. Just to show you some, here are the elderberry. Um, it's an elderberry uh, group of plants here. We have, um, <clears throat> even we allowed some of the volunteer black locusts because it, for the pollinators, but we control most of them. We have willows also for pollinators. We have a pond and we keep adding raised beds. Here is just a, a view of the wild plum orchard where we have also a companion, plant, companion plants, like in this case, we are, uh, Sue and Tony are showing a group of students um, wild onions, prairie wild onion. We have flower beds also. Right now, the, the blazing the blazing stars are just gorgeous as the ones here on the right but we had different species that we are trying and testing and we try to sell at the market this is the pond this is one of the it's a is especially for wildlife but we also tried at the beginning when uh, sue was doing the 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 assessment on the side recommended to have a pond because it was so it was wet area. So this is perfect for us, and we have tadpoles, and even the groundhog likes to hang around in this little pond. It is a wildlife friendly place. We have last year a robin that had seven babies in a nest. We were amazed. And we, it was right there in the, at the nursery. He wasn't too worried about us. And also the little bird on the right is there sitting on Jeromia's hand because he ran into the window, one of the windows of the greenhouse. Thankfully, he was okay after the, the shock of running into the window. So we try to promote also the use of the calls to deter or to warn a birds about windows that might kill them. We have an elder, this is just a, a close up of the elderberry that is growing here. Uh, we do uh, prepare value added products with some of, the, some of the harvest. And we always look for volunteers who would like to do whatever project they want. We cannot do it all. And so there are years when we do this, there are years that we just let the fruits go for the birds only. We always share though. And the whole area, the idea is that if we don't grow crops for food or for other purposes, every area will be replaced. Every area that is long now will be replaced with prairie plants. That would be good for pollinators. We uh, keep adding gardens, we have a shade garden under our linden tree. It is a non-native tree, but it's, it was hard for us to get rid of it. It serves the purpose and is very good for pollinators. And here we have just a close up of a couple um, crops that we grow under the tree. One is white leeks and we have a student, Shiler Hughes, helping us watering. So she just loves it so much, and she's a new student. Hopefully, she will join us. She will be part of the team pretty soon. And on the right, we, uh, I just, uh, we have some ostrich ferns that we are using in the future for food. That also is a, a demonstration. We do have non-natives, as I mentioned before. Figs is one of them. We have three varieties. We have been successful with one with Chicago Hardy. 
and we plan to continue because sometimes people that don't really care about native plants, they will come for the figs. So this is like our uh, way to lure people to come to see us. And figs, who doesn't like figs? And animals don't seem to like them. So they will have any problems with, um, uh, with animals eating them. We grow them in beds. I show you the front beds in front of the, uh, the, the greenhouse, but we also grow them in a small hoop house. We have been selling cuttings in the, at the farm, at the, at the farmer's market, and people really seem to be excited about that. So it's just one of our sources of funding for our programs. And just a few of the plants I mentioned already, we have persimmons, we had highly productive persimmon, but this one is actually in the native plant outdoor lab, also on campus. We have, here's another view of the wild plums that, it, that were in bloom, as I showed you before. And you can see that we are surrounded by this beautiful cottonwood, cottonwood on the right in uh, sycamore. So we allow plants, trees to grow because we want more shade. And also good for the pollinators. We have papas. We show you, I show you the front uh, beds with papas, but we also have them in the back. So they have been uh, growing for more, for about 10 years. We are excited because we've been seeing lots of zebra swallowtails hang, hanging around the, the papa trees, which is the host plant for the caterpillars. <clears throat> Some of the herbaceous plants include white leaves, and I mentioned you the, I show you the beds where Shiler was watering. We have uh, violets. <clears throat> we have golden glow or sosha with an N, not an M, uh, my mistake. This is um, a plant that is grow, it grows naturally in bottom lands. So it grows in the shade. So this, we have a few of these plants growing under the linden tree. And this is how they look <clears throat> early in the spring when you can harvest the leaves to eat them uh, to replace spinach in recipes. Another plant that we have is cup plant not only for the pollinators, but it's a very resilient plant. Even this time of the year with this heat, they're looking okay. And they are also good for to eat in the spring, the leaves. And even the stinging nettle, we have little corners. We wanna be sure that people don't get stung. I know that sometimes people don't see them and, and they might look like other plants but we're trying to be aware of that, uh, but we have, uh, we have, we're creating an additional little uh, <clears throat> garden under the, the wild plums. So they are really visible. We really love nettles and we use it a lot for recipes. In, in glade onion or prairie onion, uh, I show you the raised bed where it was growing. And we have lots of mints. Some of them are, I mentioned hairy mountain mint, and we have hairy horse mint. Then I'm still learning about this plant. I gathered the seed from um, woodland in Colombia, in Sudi, and they were very small in nature. But when I we put them in a raised bed, they really flourish. And the smell is just amazing. There is just, I really thought that it was a menta at the beginning, but it is just um, very similar to our um, <clears throat> Ohio horse mint. Then we have a slender mountain mint on the right. All of these are really looking great at the finta. We have a milkweed garden. So far, we have been able to grow six, a, a spider milkweed, top left, butterfly milkweed, top right, 
were milkweed. It's just, we were excited to see that they're really doing great. And we added it in the prairie a plot at the, that we just established this year. And common milkweed is also doing well. What we notice is that these plants are really, if you wanna provide habitat for monarch butterflies, the common, we put some common milkweed under the shade of, in this case, in our case of willows. So they uh, stay a little greener, longer. While the ones that are in the sun right now, you might have the same experience that they're getting dry. And we also prune some to be sure that there is new growth later in the year. We do have swamp milkweed and also prairie milkweed or Asclepias sullivanti, which is a, a new species for us and it's doing really great. We hope to add more. So if anybody wants to share with us other so species, we'll be happy to, to establish them in our, in, at the finger. The last group I wanna talk about is, uh, there are three plants that we have been growing for tubers, sand choke, or Jerusalem artichoke. This is a plant that is not grown in, by too many because many times people don't know what to do with them. And I think that there, is a, there are so many recipes and we have been finding ways to do it with by a pickle, pickle them and they really are tasty. And also the plants are so good for pollinators. And if, they, if you're afraid that they are too aggressive, just harvest them, and that is a way to control them. And you can see this, the plant on the right already uh, producing shoots in the spring. The, the next plant is groundnut. This one we haven't really, we did try it, grow it in a in raised bed, but they do spread. And I know we are aggressive. They are aggressive. They, they can take over a garden. So beware of that. And what we have done is to grow them in uh, tubs, like big, big uh, containers. Uh, that's a good way to do it. You don't, they don't spread too much. And then you can have a good harvest at the end of the year. And here's just a picture showing them um, shooting out in this in June and the blooms later in the summer, maybe close to fall. And the last plan is arrowhead or wapato. This is or, uh, also called duck potato. This is a wetland plant. So we started growing them in two years ago in 2020. And we have been very successful to um, reproduce them. We, uh, this year, what we are doing here is Tony and Jeromia. They just established them with different, three different uh, combinations of compost in different uh, soil. We can share the result with you when you want to come. This is, this was taken maybe about the picture about three weeks ago, but today, the, the leaves are already growing large. They really love the heat. They are in the water as long as they don't get hot and they seem to be doing well. And this is under the wild plum. Now we have the, what we do with this, with the, all the native plants is we like to do food tasting. We develop recipes and this is for in general for the whole program but we have been doing at the Finca, uh, we offer tours for groups. If you wanna come as a, if you come as, a, in, as part of a group, uh, you can actually talk to us in advance if you wanna do it uh, on your own. But yeah, I'll talk about one tour that we're having pretty soon. While we test the recipes, we do, a, we had in the past dining wilds and we are hoping to do this pretty soon. We just got a, a grant from the Missouri Department of Agriculture to keep the, uh, testing native edibles as a specialty crops. So we hope that in, uh, in a near future, we'll be inviting you to joining us for a dining wild.
And with that, I thank you for your time. I know that this is a very short tour of the Finca, but this is just to make to make, get you excited about the place. This is a, an idea for somebody that has one acre, half an acre of land. You don't know what to do with it. You feel that you can maybe, it's too much work, but you can come and see what we are doing. You can start with a few, uh, just a step at a time. And for, uh, so if you wanna come and see what we do, we have a Finca tour on Thursday, October 27th. So save the date. It will be from 4 to 6.30 p.m. And we are going to uh, promote it through our Facebook page, as well as Grenada would help us to spread the word. And with that, I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Nadia. This is Carol David, director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation and the Grenada program. That was really lovely. and. Um, I am really spoiled because I live within walking distance of the Finca. <laughs> and it's, uh, well, as you say, it's both uh, producing foods, but also demonstrating what other people can do. So it's a great uh, diversified farm in itself and also an example for other people. Um, we do have some questions. Um, Jackie asked, what part of duck potato is edible? It's a tuber. It's an, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the, the leaves are edible too, but all we have done so far is to eat the, the tubers. You just, sometimes you don't even have to peel them, but because they grow in, in really like muggy conditions, it's, if you do it yourself at home, it's much easier to, to grow them. And then they taste a little bit like a water chestnuts. And you can pickle them or put them in recipes like Chinese recipes and similar uh, recipes like that. Thanks, Nadia. I have a question myself about um, the duck potato and there's another one too. My question is, so uh, you said you pickle it and then do, otherwise is it eaten raw or is it cooked? No, it is. A, I would recommend to eat it, uh, to cook it. At this it. point, we are not really, well, the, it's pickled raw, but we let it um, pickle for a few months. And I have one in my refrigerator that has been there for a whole year. And it's, it's really, it's still doing, it's still fine. Great. And the question, is the arrowhead grown in containers just to get it started or also to prevent it from spreading? We just use them to grow them in the, the tops. We don't have them growing. Well, actually, we have them in, a, in the pond, a little pond that I show you. And we, we actually welcome it. We don't try to control them. And I understand that they, this is different in a situation in a big pond, but this is a very tiny pond that we have. And so it helps to to protect a uh, tadpole sometimes when it gets too hot and maybe the water it gets too low. So we don't try to control it. We just use it for, uh, to produce the tubers. That's, what, that's our, when we put them in the tops, that's the purpose of doing that. I, I think like you say, it's just to have more space, right? I mean, you just don't have as much space in the pond for that many. So the containers just give you more space. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and also well, the reason we grow them in the tops is that it's very hard to harvest them in, in, from plants. And it's very, sometimes uh, you can, I mean, you can get into it, it, you can get in the plants, but it's very hard. So it just to, to ease the way to harvest them. And they seem to produce well, even when you put it in pots. Well, in harvesting, that's a really important consideration when you're growing these specialty crops. Mm -hmm. um, another question, Jackie says, when's the best time to prune common milkweed to expand its season for butterflies? I do it before, when it's too hot, I don't even try because it might be, might damage your plant, but I would do it after rain and no later than June. Right now, if you have them growing in the shade and you can water, you can keep doing it, but it's just hard to, to do it when it's too hot. Thank you. It's a question from Richard. 
What are your suggestions for keeping birds from hitting windows? What we do, uh, like in the in the in Christmas during Christmas time, we make a little wreaths and we put them in every window. I know there's a lot of work, but if you see my yard at home, I mean my our uh, windows at home, I put a um, I just make wreaths with with like like grapevine. And I and I I just use them for as an ornament, but at the same time, the turks, the wind, the the birds from hitting them. I haven't had any doing a, running into the windows for a while since I started doing that. And I use the decals, but I'm not sure about how effective those are. Thank you. I I I have some decals um, on some of my windows. Um, and uh, sometimes I think they are helping to some degree. Um, Nadia, you mentioned that um, the tour of the Finca you're offering on uh, October 27th, I think you said four to six or, did, or was it 4.30 to 6.30? Yeah, we have four to 6.30 because four to it's usually four, 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. And that would be on a Thursday and um, yeah, and then we can, we'll send the invitation um, pretty soon. And we're hoping to have a, not only a tour of the garden, but also some food sampling of some of the, the plants that we harvest. Wonderful. Uh, yes, and, and as you mentioned, our Grow Native program, we'll be happy to help promote that. Uh, we do have another question from Jill. When you grow figs and hoop houses, do you leave them in there year round? If yes, are the hoop houses heated in cold weather? We don't use any heating or cooling in the hoop house. Uh, she, she said, you say figs, the figs? Yes, figs. Yeah, the figs, um, we don't, we just leave them year round, but we have also some outside so we're gonna compare this year. We planted them, the ones that are planted outside of the hoop house were planted last year. So we're gonna see what happens, but we they both survived, but we did protect them with a, a big, um, it was like a cage. Um, I mean, Tony and Jerome and Sue, they did a wonderful job. They made cages and then, and then put hay, a, a, straw okay, around them. So that was a way to protect them. But we actually try in the hoop house, we did both. We protected some and we, we didn't protect others and they both survive the same way in the hoop house. Uh, the ones outside were protected. So I think it's a trial and error thing because some of, depending where you live, some of the plants might be uh, exposed to more cold weather. I think you're right, Nadia, and it does depend on exposure. Um, I have a fig tree in my yard and we create a kind of a temporary cage with wire and then we fill it with fallen leaves, which is the kind of the same uh, protection that your, that your straw provided. And we have a couple more questions. Peter asks, can a person visit the finca during the week? Yeah, I just said you have to tell it, let us know if you want to see us. I mean, the place is open, but if you want a tour, just contact us. So at least uh, somebody can greet you and show you around. And can they use your email address that's on the screen to contact yes. you? Yeah. Can they, can they go just even if they don't want a tour, or would you prefer that people let you know? I think it's better if they at least they let us know they plan to go. Uh, as I mentioned, the Native Plant Outdoor Lab that is uh, also on campus, that is more open. But the, this is uh, surrounded by gates and the doors might be closed. Sometimes mm -hmm. the police close the, the gates when we're not around. Thank you. So if you, it is open, uh, but do contact Nadia at the email if you'd like to visit the Finca. And as Nadia said, also on campus is the Native Outdoor uh, uh, Plant Laboratory, which is also a Grow Native Garden of Excellence. And um, Erica could include a link to that page to the Outdoor Laboratory in the email that goes out tomorrow um, with a recording of this webinar. We have another question. What do you do with pokeweed? I'm sorry, please repeat. 
What do you do with poke weed? Oh, with poke, um, we actually use a more like a wildlife friendly plant because I mean, we, we have eaten it. We do the, the, we use the leaves, but you have to wash them three, I mean, to, to boil them three times. <laughs> and in the end, it just, you end up with mashed leaves. Mm -hmm. So we eat them, but with the proper uh, uh, preparation, and we prefer to have them for wildlife. It's just a perfect plan for uh, uh, to shelter birds and also provides food for them later in the fall. Thanks, Nadia. And that's right, with any wild plant, um, you do have to be careful. Uh, there can be allergic reactions. Um, and as Nadia said with the poke, uh, you have to boil the leaves three times and drain off that water. Um, so it, you do end up with um, pretty, uh, uh, very well cooked greens. And I, I always wonder about the nutritional content after being boiled three times, but I, I don't know, maybe there is some. Well, and that's actually reminds me that I mentioned the, the grant that we got from the Department of Agriculture. That's part of the, the grant. We're gonna evaluate uh, the nutritional value of some of the natives that we don't know anything about. Or maybe there is some, there are some studies, but they are forgotten. Mm -hmm. So we'll be doing that. And maybe I can, we'll find out if there is any nutrients left in poke. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful that you got that, uh, that grant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't see any, any more questions right now. But uh, uh, we'll just have some closing remarks. But if anybody does have any more questions, do share them. Um, we do have a native edibles page on the Grow Native website, which includes a number of recipes that Nadia has developed. And there's some other information about other uh, native edibles as well. So um, Erica can include that link in uh, what she sends out in an email tomorrow. Um, Nadia is a wealth of information and the uh, Finca and the Outdoor Laboratory are wonderful additions to the Lincoln University campus. Great examples of how uh, you, uh, institutions of higher learning can incorporate native plants on campuses and a wonderful addition uh, in Jefferson City. Um, so with that, I don't see any other questions. So thank you, Nadia, very much. And thanks everyone for tuning in. And do watch for information about the field day at the Finca in October. And if you'd like to visit the Finca, do let Nadia know ahead of time by emailing her at the email address on the screen. Yeah, and the, thank you, Carol. I appreciate that. I know that you know what we do and it is very, we uh, appreciate the support. And also there is, there will be other activities where offering classes about native edibles and they can check the native, my Facebook page, Native Plants and More. Wonderful. All, All right. right. With that, uh, have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again, Nadia. Um, Nadia will have, we're having a master class. Nadia is providing a master class on native edibles for Grow Native um, this uh, coming up yet this year. So do watch our e newsletter. Um, our social media and Grow Native website. For that, that'll be a wonderful opportunity to get some more in-depth information from Nadia. All right, well, thanks again, Nadia. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.